Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Erdős Kóredó theorems for permutations. I seem to be always be talking about this theorem. It's kind of my favorite theorem. Um, what I'm going to show is a bunch of work that I've done over a couple of years with different people. At the end, there's some new results that I've been working on. So can everyone hear and see okay? I can only see a couple of faces, so. Okay, so I'm going to start with what the Erdős Kóredó theorem is all about. Uh, when you're talking about the erdős radeau theorem, you've got a set system, a k-set system, from, which is a collection of subsets. All of the subsets have to have size k, and they're coming from a base set of size n. Uh, what I'm looking for are intersecting sets. So a k-set system is going to be t-intersecting. If I pull out any two elements in the set, they have to have at least t elements in common. And so the idea with the erdős radeau theorem is to answer two questions. Uh, when I have my t, so the size of intersection, k, the size of the sets, n, the size of the base set, if all of those guys are fixed, what's the largest intersecting set system I can build? And the follow-up question is, what's the structure of the largest such intersecting set system? Now, this theorem's been completely answered. Uh, by the erdős radeau theorem. And the answer is as nice as it could possibly be. It starts, you have your condition. If your n is large relative to your k and your t, then the size of the maximum system can be n minus t choose k minus t. And you're going to hit this bound if and only if your system is the collection of all sets that contain effects, a fixed t set. So what we do is we fix an element 1, 2, up to t. And then we've got k minus t positions left open, and we've got n minus t elements that we can print in those guys. So we just take all the sets that have a common t set and we fill it in, and those are going to be the biggest. Um, <clears throat> so the theorem was first published in 61 by Erdős Kóredó. They gave this bound that your fk, your function has to be something like this. They basically said, this is a crazy bound. We know it's not right, but you need some sort of bound. Frankel came up with what's the correct bound. And in the 70s, he proved it works, but when t is large. A bunch of other people worked on this, but Wilson gave lovely algebraic proof that gave this correct bound for all values of t. And so his work was sort of motivated a lot of the stuff that we're going to look at. Um, a few years later, in the late 90s, Elsveda and Ketchatryan gave uh, what they called the complete erdős radeau theorem. <clears throat> so if you tell them any values of n, k, and t, they can tell you exactly which set systems are the largest. Maybe I'll just point out too that there's two parts to this theorem. There's the bound and there's a characterization. Okay, so there's a lot of different proofs of the theorem. Um, my favorite is to use algebraic graph theory, which is why we're here today. Uh, we can define a graph called the Knesser graph, which I think is everybody has seen this graph, I, ho I hope. Uh, what we do is we make all of the k subsets of an n set our vertices, and we make them adjacent if they're not intersecting. So the way we've defined this graph is exactly so that the things we're looking for, an intersecting set system, is exactly an independent set, or as I prefer to call, a co-clique. So if we have a set of vertices in our graph, and no two of those vertices are adjacent, then what we're looking at is exactly an intersecting set system. And now our question becomes, what's the largest co-clique in the graph, and what's the structure of the largest co-clique? And that, that's what the erdős radeau theorem answers. So we know the answer here. Okay, so here's a picture, good old Peterson graph. Um, it's a pretty graph, it's regular, we know its degree, it's vertex transitive, it's edge transitive. Uh, we can even see the maximum clique size is really easy because we just want to make disjoint sets of size k. Okay, the way that I prefer to look at this problem and to work on it is to use algebra. And so we can look at the adjacency matrix for the graph. What we do is we make a matrix where the rows and columns are indexed by the vertices of the graph. And then the entry, so for two vertices in the graph, 
the entry in the matrix is a one if they're adjacent and a zero if they're not. And once we have the adjacency matrix, we can figure out its eigenvalues and we can calculate all of the eigenvalues and we can calculate the multiplicities. And when we do this, there's, I think there's more than one way to do it, but we can use um, the irreducible representations of the symmetric group on acting on n points to help us out. And what we get is if I take this sim k times sim n minus k, this is a young subgroup. If I take the trivial representation on that young subgroup and induce it up to the symmetric group, it's going to give me a representation of the symmetric group. I can write its decomposition. And for each one of these guys in the decomposition, I get one of my eigenvalues. And there's this relationship between the irreducible representations in this, uh, in this representation and the eigenvalues of my uh, kinesographs. OK, <clears throat> so once I have my eigenvalues, what I'm going to use is the, the ratio bound. <clears throat> So I'm gonna define the ratio bound a little bit more generally. I'm gonna look at weighted adjacency matrices. So what I just defined was the adjacency matrix where our rows and columns are indexed by vertices of the graph and the entries are zero or one, depending on whether or not they're adjacent. What we can actually do is we can weight the entries so that the entries are zero or some weight um, and they only get a non-zero weight if they're adjacent, but they don't have to be, you, you can weight edges with a zero if you want, and your, your matrix has to stay symmetric. So when we hold on to a weighted adjacency matrix, we want a constant row sum D, that's like the degree of the graph. We can take the eigenvalues of the weighted adjacency matrix, and there's this ratio bound that gives us an upper bound on the size of the maximum co-clique. So alpha A is the size of the maximum co-clique in our graph. It's called the ratio bound because the thing we look at is the ratio between the largest eigenvalue and the smallest eigenvalue. And so the least eigenvalue we call tau, and it's going to be like a biggish negative number. It's always going to be negative. Okay, so the ratio bound gives us a bound on the size of our co cliques, and it depends on the eigenvalues. If we have equality in the ratio bound, we actually get another thing in that. If we have a maximum co-clique that meets this bound, I can write out its characteristic vector. So this is a zero one vector. I put a one if my uh, element is S and a zero if it's not. And I'm gonna subtract off a multiple of the all ones vector. So this guy, this one is the all ones vector. This weighting makes this vector orthogonal to the all ones vector. So when I take my characteristic vector, subtract off the appropriate multiple of the all ones, this becomes an eigenvector for the tau eigenvalue. Okay, so with the ratio bound, we get a bound and we get sort of a bit of a characterization. So we can use this uh, to do our erdos co redo theorem for the kinesograph because we figured out the eigenvalues. We drop in the eigenvalues in our kinesograph, we get the bound. And this is for just t equaling one, so we're just looking for intersecting sets. Okay, and we can also push this a little bit further and get a characterization. So um, if the i is the characteristic vector of the collection of all sets that contain i, when I take that characteristic vector, subtract off the appropriate multiple of the all ones vector, this is an eigenvector for the least eigenvalue. I can show that these vectors span the eigenspace. And then using the ratio bound, if I have any other intersecting sets of intersecting sets that meet the ratio bound, they're going to be an eigenvector. Like when I take the characteristic vector and I subtract off the appropriate multiple of the all ones, that's also going to be an eigenvector for the same eigenvalue. And so what that means is the characteristic vector for any maximum co-clique is going to be a linear combination of these nice ones, these VIJs that I, that I these, v, these VIs. So that tells me that I can express um, 
anytime I've got a maximum co-clique, its characteristic vectors, a nice linear combination, and then with a little bit of work, I can show that the only linear combinations that give me co-cliques of the right size are where we have a trivial linear combination, where one of these VIs gets weighted one and everything else gets weighted zero. Okay, so we've got a bound and we can use the bound and the fact that we have eigenvectors to give us a characterization. Um, okay, is that okay? Are the questions yet? I see nothing in the chat. Okay, perfect. Okay, so Wilson's proof did a variation of this, but he had to work a little bit harder. So in the last one, we did one intersecting. He wants to look at T intersection. So we defined a graph, the vertices are K subsets, they're adjacent if their intersection is less than T. So before we had, they had an edge if they had zero inter intersection, now we want to put an edge if they have intersection less than T. And this has the same property that our co cliques are exactly the uh, T intersecting sets. Now what Wilson had to do was he had to do a weighted adjacency matrix. If you take the plain old adjacency matrix for this graph, you don't get the ratio bound holding with equality, but he gave this weighting and then he was able to show um, that the largest eigenvalue was this number and that the least eigenvalue was this and that um, when you take those guys and you put them in the ratio bound, you get exactly the number you want. And he was also able to use this idea with the eigenvectors to get the characterization. Okay, so that is the erdos coredo theorem uh, for sets, briefly, and from the approach that I want to take. Uh, one of the things that happens with the erdos coredo theorem is that people then start looking at applying this to other objects. So anytime you have a bunch of objects that have some idea of intersection, you can always ask, what's the biggest set? So the ones I've been curious about are intersecting permutations. So I'm going to say two permutations in the symmetric group are going to be intersecting if there's some i that they both map to the same spot. So if you picture intersections as a bunch of pairs, i goes to j. If you've got a pair that's common in two permutations, they intersect. Or I can write it this way. If I multiply one with the inverse of the other, it's going to have a fixed point. Okay, so we call a permutation a derangement if it has no fixed points. So two permutations are going to be intersecting if the inverse of one times the other is not a derangement. And then we're back in the same situation. We have the same two questions. Uh, if we're looking at a permutation group, what's the largest intersecting set? And the follow-up question is, once you know what the biggest is, who hits that maximum? What's the characterization of the largest intersecting sets? Okay, I'm gonna define the canonical intersecting sets. These are my favorite guys. They're the ones I'm rooting for. Uh, the canonical intersecting sets are the set of all permutations that map I to J. Clearly these guys are gonna be intersecting. If we have I to I, this is gonna be the stabilizer of a point. If I is not equal to J, we're the coset of the stabilizer of a point. I'm going to call the characteristic vector Vij. I think that's going to come up later. If your group is transitive, then we know exactly the size of these guys. We can also look at T intersecting. So what we want is rather than one point where they map to the same spot, there's T points that the permutations map to the same T points. So if we look at a pointwise stabilizer of a set of size T, then that's going to be uh, the canonical T intersecting permutations. Okay, so in 1977, Desa and Frankel uh, said that if we're looking at the symmetric group, the size of an intersecting set is no more than n minus one factorial. And what they did is they looked at the subgroup generated by an n cycle. So I have that subgroup sitting right here. So what I have in this little chart are the elements in SIM4. And this first row here is C, which is generated by an N cycle. What I have the next line is the coset of C, and this is another coset of C, but you'll figure it out once I, once I do one coset. 
When I look at my C, all the non-identity elements are derangements. So if I have a sigma and a pi from my, from my group, when I multiply one times the inverse of the other, I'm still in my group because it's a group. So this guy's going to be a derangement. So this C gives me a subgroup where all the non-identity elements are a derangement. So no two guys in C can be intersecting. My next row is a coset of C, and I'm going to have the same thing going on. If I pick an element from the coset and another element, and I multiply one by the inverse of the other, it's still going to be a derangement. So what happens is I can take my entire group and block it off into, I, well, sim has n factorial, I'm dividing it by n, n minus 1 factorial groups, and within each, I shouldn't call them groups, right? It's groups and their cosets. I can divide it up into n minus 1 factorial blocks, and when it, within each block, no two permutations are intersecting. So if I want to find an intersecting collection of permutations, at best I can take one from each of the blocks, and that gives me the bound of the n minus 1 factorial. Okay, this example is going to come up a little bit again. Um, Wang and Zhang in uh, 2008, they have a lovely proof of the characterization of the maximum intersecting sets in sim n that sort of uses this idea but pushes it a little bit harder to get the characterization. Okay, Cameron and Ku in 2003, they gave the characterization as well. Uh, they showed that the maximum intersecting sets in sim n are only these uh, canonical ones, the sets i, j. And more recently, Alice Friedgut and Pippel did the same thing, but for T intersecting. And their paper is lovely. Um, one thing that they have is that you need the N sufficiently large. And I think the conjectured bound is that N is greater than 2T plus 1. In their paper, they weren't able to get a lower bound on N. And they don't think that their method would ever work to get the exact lower bound, so it's still open what the exact lower bound is. But we know eventually the uh, canonical t-intersecting ones are the largest. Okay, so the thing I've been interested in, well I guess those last two, the last page basically says we know more or less what's happening for the symmetric group. So what we can look at is any group in sim n and ask what's the largest collection of intersecting permutations in this group G. And the way I'm going to approach it is like what we did with the Knesset graph. I'm going to define a graph and use the ratio bound. So for any group in sim n, we can define a derangement graph. Uh, I call it gamma G. The vertices are going to be the elements of the group, and two vertices are going to be adjacent if this guy, one times the inverse of the other, is a derangement. So again, I've done exactly the thing where I've set up the graph so that the intersecting things that I'm looking for are exactly the co -cliques. Just one thing to be really clear about, I talk about this like it's a property of the group. The group needs to have an action, and when you change the action, like everything changes. So the derangement graph absolutely depends on the action. I usually write my group as a permutation group, and then the action is sort of fixed. Okay, and this graph is fabulous because it's a Cayley graph. It's a Cayley graph on our group. The connection set is the set of derangements. And one thing that's fun just to note right off the top is our derangement graph is going to be connected if and only if the derangements generate the group. And so when derangements generate a group is something algebraists look at, and we sort of capture that in this, in this graph. Okay, so here's a picture of the derangement graph for the dihedral group. Um, we can see right away this dihedral group has a clique. This, this, um, these four vertices are all adjacent. And you can see that uh, if you take the coset of that group, you'll get this set. And again, it's a clique as well. So anytime we have an intersecting set in the derangement graph, we can have at most one vertex from the red square and one vertex from the green square. So we can't have any more than two adjacent uh, permutations in the di this dihedral group. 
Okay, it also, well, let's go over some of its properties. It's vertex transitive. Uh, the group acts on the vertices of the group just by multiplying. So we have that G is a subgroup of the automorphism group of the graph, and that can be quite useful. Uh, an intersecting set was defined exactly to be a co-clique. If we have a sharply one transitive set, and what you can even picture was that C, the subgroup generated by the cycle, one, two, up to N. If we have a sharply one transitive set, then we've got a clique of size N. If we have a clique of size N, uh, we can use the clique co-clique bound, and we can get uh, upper bound on the size of our co-cliques. So this is what we used for the symmetric group, was showing that, um, yeah, that's what we used when we were in the symmetric group. I think I have it on the next slide. Yeah, so if our group has a sharply, trans a sharply transitive subgroup, then we know that the size of the canonical guys are the size of the group over N, because if it has a transitive subgroup, it has to be transitive. But then once it has the transitive subgroup, it has a clique, and so the clique co-clique bound tells us that the canonical intersecting sets are the maximum. Um, our graph is also a normal Cayley graph. I just learned recently there's two different definitions of a normal Cayley graph. So for me, a normal Cayley graph means that the connection set, so the set of derangements, it's closed under conjugation. Once we have a normal Cayley graph, I can calculate the eigenvalues of my graph from the irreducible representations of uh, the irreducible characters of my group. So I go to my group. Each time I have an irreducible character, I can calculate an eigenvalue by taking the value of that character and summing over my connection set, so summing over my derangements. I also get that the eigenspaces for my graph are going to be a union of irreducible G modules. So for each irreducible character, I get an eigenvalue and there's a module. Two different irreducible characters could give me the same eigenvalue, so my eigenspace might be the union of two of these modules. But what it means is that I can figure out projections to these modules using my irreducible characters. And so I've got a pretty little formula that I can use. Okay, just a quick easy example. If I'm holding on to a Frobenius group, I can look at my irreducible representations and I can write down the spectrum. And as soon as you look at the spectrum, the first thing you think is, that's complete. And it's true that the derangement graph for Frobenius group is uh, k copies of the complete graph on n vertices. So we know everything we could possibly want to know about that graph. Another example is PGL2Q. This again is a group where the character theory is completely understood. We can go through our uh, characters and we can calculate the eigenvalues and we can just write them out as a list. And once we have these eigenvalues, we can put them in the ratio bound and we can show exactly, well, in this case, we can show that the stabilizers of the point are indeed the largest intersecting uh, sets. Okay, oh, I guess maybe I could go back. The reason that PG, well, part of PG, let's just go back for a second. Um, Pablo Spiga and I spent some quality time with PGL2Q and looking at uh, the intersecting sets here. And one thing that worked really nice is that PGL2Q is two transitive. And once we're looking at two transitive groups, um, a lot of things work out really nicely. So I'm gonna call the permutation character, the character that takes an element in the group and just returns how many fixed points it has. And then I'm going to define chi of g to be the number of fixed points minus one. So this uh, character is the permutation character minus the trivial character. And the nice thing we get is that this a group is going to be too transitive exactly when this character is irreducible. And it's actually really easy to do. We just take the inner product of the character with itself and we can expand it out. Um, if our group is too transitive, this number here using Burnside's lemma, counts how many orbits the group has 
on pairs. And it's going to have two orbits on pairs because it's going to have one where the pairs are the same, so the diagonal. And because it's too transitive, it's only going to have one on the pairs that are different. This is the number of orbits it has times two, so on minus two. This number is pretty clearly a one. So what happens is that my group is too transitive if and only if this particular character is irreducible. So for every irreducible, for every two transitive group, we have a really useful character that we know is irreducible. I can take it and I can calculate what eigenvalue this irreducible representation, this irreducible character is going to give us. We calculate the eigenvalue by taking all of the elements in our connection set, so all of our derangements, and evaluating the character on them. Well, this character is number of fixed points minus one, and we're giving it derangements, so it's always going to be negative one, and so we get this beautiful eigenvalue. So whenever we have a two transitive group, we're guaranteed that this is going to be one of our eigenvalues. And we can also get a formula for the projection onto the eigenspace corresponding to this guy if you pretend to ignore the fact that it could have a second character having that same eigenvalue. So I call it module rather than eigenspace. Okay, so this character is going to be called chi. We've got our eigenvalue. I'm going to call uh, this a permutate, the permutation module. The permutation module is the module that corresponds to the permutation character. It's the sum of E1, which is the E1 is the projection down to the constant vector, so the multiples of the all ones. And E chi is the module that corresponds to this representation. I hope that's clear. It's a little bit annoying about whether or not you have the all ones or not. Okay, so if we're holding on to two transitive group, we know we have this number as an eigenvalue. If it's the least eigenvalue, what we can do is drop it into the ratio bound, and the number that comes up is exactly the size of the stabilizer of a point. So if this magic eigenvalue just so happens to be the least, then we have by the ratio bound that the two transitive group, um, the largest intersecting sets in the, in the group have the same size as the stabilizer of a point. But it, it can happen that we'll have a two transitive group where this eigenvalue isn't the least, where there's another one kicking around. We can also take this a little bit further. If chi is the only uh, irreducible character that gives us this eigenvalue, then the characteristic vector for any maximum co-clique is going to be in this permutation module. Okay, just a couple of notes. Um, if your group is too transitive, then this VIJ, so remember this VIJ is the characteristic vector for the canonical co -cliques. So the VIJ is the characteristic vector for all the permutations that map I to J. Those guys have to be in the permutation module. And the reason I know that is I have this matrix, this projection, I can write it down. I have this vector and I can actually just calculate the entries and I see I come out to here so that when I take this vector and I project it into the module, it stays exactly the same. So this vector is sitting inside the module. I can actually take a subset of these VIJs. So my IJ, I'm going from one up to N minus one. So I'm throwing away some of the vectors. If I take these vectors, they actually form a basis for my module. Okay. So just some terminology, I say that a group has the EKR property if the canonically intersecting sets, so those are the stabilizers of the points and their cosets, uh, if those guys are the maximum intersecting sets, then the group has the EKR property. Uh, so Pablo Spiga and Tiep and I proved that every two transitive group is going to have the EKR property. And we did two reductions. The first one is if we have the sharply one transitive subgroup, then using the clique co clique bound, we've got the EKR property. The other thing is that if our group has a subgroup that has the EKR property, so if the little guy has the EKR property, then the big guy's going to have the EKR property. So whenever we're looking at our two transitive groups, 
they have a unique minimal normal subgroup. This unique minimal normal subgroup is either going to be regular or not. If it's regular, then we're in the first case where we've got a clique of the right size and we can use the clique co-clique bound. If it's not regular, then it's of almost simple type. And so what we did is we went to all the groups of almost simple type and picked the minimal ones and looked at them. So I have a little chart here that has the two transitive groups of almost simple type. So these are our groups. These are the minimal subgroups. So what we can do is if I can go through this list and I can prove each of these have the EKR property, then all of the groups of this type have the EKR property. And that's just what we did. Uh, we went through sort of one by one. Uh, it's color coded. The red ones are finite, so I just made gap do it. Uh, this gray one is finite, but when you just do this plain old adjacency matrix, you don't get the right numbers, so you have to use a weighted adjacency matrix, but it works. Uh, these blue ones, uh, the character tables were well understood and we could write them down and uh, the adjacency matrix worked. These purple ones were the most fun because we could write down what the eigenvalues were, but we had to use a weighted adjacency matrix. And the most fun was this PSU3. It really didn't look like it could work, but magically there was like a unique weighted matrix, adjacency matrix that worked. Okay, so the next thing, we have the EKR property, which is the size, and then there's the strict EKR property, which is the characterization. So we say that a group has the strict EKR property if the canonically intersecting sets are the only maximum intersecting sets. So just a summary of what is known here. The symmetric group has the strict EKR property, and this is what Cameron and Koo did back in 2003, I guess. Uh, Chris and I did another proof that was more algebraic more recently. When you look at PGL2Q, Pablo and I showed that if n is 2, it has the strict EKR property, but if n is greater than or equal to 3, it does not have the EKR property. But what uh, we're, uh, Pablo and I just did it for n equals 3, and what we showed is that uh, your maximum intersecting sets are either going to be the stabilizer of a point or the stabilizer of a hyperplane. And then recently, uh, Pablo Spiga did it for n, uh, for n greater than or equal to 4. So he did, he did the rest of them. Um, so they don't have the EKR property, but we do have the characterization of all of the maximum intersecting sets. Uh, PSL uh, has the strict EKR property, and this was Long, Plaza, Singh, and Zheng. Um, they had to work pretty hard to get the characterization. It was, it was a tricky problem. Uh, my student, Bama Namadi, and I showed that the alternating group and the Matthew groups have the strict EKR. These are pretty easy because the Matthew groups are finite, so we could just check them. And just the other day, on the weekend, I was just checking these sporadic guys. Uh, the Matthew 11 on, acting on 12 points has the strict EKR. The other two guys do not have the strict EKR. And I was able to show they did not have the strict EKR by doing something really cheesy and really easy. Uh, I put them into GAP, and I asked GAP to find the conjugacy classes of subgroups. I asked for the subgroups that were the right size, and I just checked if they were co cliques or not. And both of these guys had examples of subgroups that were co cliques that weren't the stabilizers of points. So I know they're not strict EKR. Okay, so this is newish. Um, this name is maybe terrible. I say a group has the EKR module property if the characteristic vector of any maximum intersecting set is in the permutation module. So when we we're proving that these two, um, these two transitive groups have the strict EKR, we first show they have the EKR property by doing the ratio bound. Then we showed that they had the EKR module property and that the characteristic vector of any maximum intersecting set is in this permutation module. So the characteristic vector of the things we're looking for have to be a linear combination of the um, canonical intersecting sets, so the stabilizers of the points and their cosets. And then once we had that, we could get the characterization by looking at a matrix and doing a matrix calculation. So in a sense, this property sort of sits, it, it's sort of the middle step when we're showing that the EK, uh, when we're showing two transitive groups have the strict EKR.
Okay, so recently Peterson and I were working on this and we've proven that all two transitive groups have the EKR module property. So it's sort of one step further than having the EKR property. And what this means is when, wherever we're looking at a two transitive group, the characteristic vector of any maximum intersecting set is gonna be a linear combination of these VIJs. So I'll just sort of outline our approach. We did the same uh, trick that I, we did with uh, Pablo, Pablo and uh, Spiga and Tiep and I did, where we put the groups into two categories, the ones with the regular minimal normal subgroup and the ones that don't. So the groups that have the minimal normal subgroup have a clique of size n. So we, we've got the bound, there's a maximum co-clique of size, any maximum co-clique of size, the group divided by n, is going to meet this subgroup in exactly one vertex. And then what, I'm gonna, what we did is we took the characteristic vector for an arbitrary maximum intersecting set, subtracted off the appropriate multiple of the all ones, and calculated the projection to the chi module. So this was the same sort of trick that we did when we showed that the VIJs span uh, the permutation module. So what we can do is we can calculate this and show that it's exactly the same. So that tells us that this guy is in the permutation module. And the calculation comes down to looking at this sum. And we can figure out what this sum is based on what if our y is in s and if our y is not in s. If our y is in s, then this number here, this sy inverse, is conjugate to an element in the stabilizer of a point and we can come up with the sum being the size of the stabilizer of a point. And if it's not in S, then we can get the sum is the same as the HN inverse, where this guy is in, where the H is in the stabilizer of a point. So this calculation is really similar to what we did when we were showing that the VIJs are in the permutation module. There's just a little more algebra that we needed to do to make it work. Uh, the next case was when our groups had a minimal normal subgroup was not regular. So in this case, we held on to the minimal normal subgroup K. And what we could, the idea was to prove that if the K has the EKR module property, then the G is going to have the EKR module property. And sort of what I did is I looked at two different adjacency matrices for gamma of G. So our gamma of G is going to contain the index of K and G many copies of gamma K. So K is a subgroup of G. So gamma K is going to be a subgraph of gamma G. And so I made an adjacency matrix by just taking copies of the gamma K and ignoring all the edges between them. And what we you could show is that if we have a maximum intersecting set in G, then it's going to be a vector an eigenvector for this A, so the graph, uh, the adjacency matrix where we throw away the edges between these gamma Ks. So it's gonna be an eigenvector for A, and we can find all the G modules that are eigenspaces with the right eigenvalue for A. So then we also went back to the normal adjacency matrix for gamma G, and we could see which modules give us the right eigenspace for A, and which modules give us the right eigenspace for the adjacency matrix for gamma G, and there's only one module that worked for both of these matrices. So I'm not sure if I'm explaining this really well, um, but I took a weighted adjacency matrix and a regular adjacency matrix, and I knew that my vectors would be eigenvectors for both of them, but between the two of them, there's only one module that gave us both the properties that we needed. So I was using different adjacency matrices to sort of narrow down which module you'd be sitting in. Okay, so anyways, the upshot is if I go through that table of all of the groups where the minimal normal subgroup is not regular, I can go through and check each one. In each one, I could find a weighted adjacency matrix where chi was the only irreducible character that gave me the right eigenvalue. So we could show that um, the minimal, the, 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 the minimal normal 
a group had the eCare module property, so the group had the eCare module property, and all of our two transitive groups have the EKR module property. So there's actually some interesting implications that if we hold on to a two transitive group and S is any maximum intersecting set, then our set S is going to have the same inner distribution as the stabilizer of a point. So the inner distribution would be the number of pairs in our set, where I take one multiplied by the inverse of the other, and I count wh which conjugacy class it's in. So um, that I thought was an interesting characterization. Uh, if our maximum intersecting set happens to be a group, then if I take the trivial representation on that group and induce it up, I get the same representation as if I take the trivial on the stabilizer of a point and induce it up. So uh, this gets to group theory I don't know much about, but when does a group have a non-conjugate subgroup that gives the same induced representations? So if I have a group, if, if my group G is not strictly EKR, and I have a canonical co-clique that's a group, then the group S is not going to be conjugate to the stabilizer of a point, or else it would be the stabilizer of a point. But when I induce up the trivial representation, I'm going to get the same representation. So one of the questions I have is that if we're holding on to a two transitive group, all of my examples where we're not strict EKR and we've got another set that's intersecting of maximum size, they're always groups or cosets of a group. So when we're at a two transitive group, are all the maximum intersecting sets always groups or cosets? Which when I first saw this pattern, I was like, that can't possibly be true. But now I'm thinking, I think it might be true. Okay, so um, one transitive groups. When I'm holding on to a one transitive group, I still have the set ij, so permutations of map i to j, and I know the size. Um, if I take the number of fixed points minus one, it's still going to be a representation. It's just not going to be irreducible. So my next idea was to try this approach with one transitive groups. And what I want to do is weight the conjugacy classes in the group so that all the representations that are in this guy give the same eigenvalue and see if I can make the ratio bound work. And so the first group I tried was, oh, Oh yeah, so if we're looking at a transitive group, can we prove that the characteristic vector of a maximum co-clique is in the permutation module? So we can ask questions about, uh, does a one transitive group have the EKR module property? Uh, the group I looked at was the general linear group. Um, it's got a one transitive action. It has a nice big clique. Uh, I know the size of my, co of my stabilizers. And if I do the eigenvalues of the derangement graph, I get these numbers, and you don't really need to look at them too closely. The upshot is that the ratio bound doesn't work with the uh, adjacent, just the plain old adjacency matrix for the graph. But I know that the group has the EKR property because I've got a clique of the right size. So what I did is I looked at the consciousy classes and I could find a weighting on the consciousy classes that would give me equality in the ratio bound. So I could actually find a weighting and make it work. And with a bit of an extra argument using the clique, I could prove that GL2Q has the EKR module property. Uh, when you'd get to this EKR module property, it says that the characteristic vectors of the things you're looking for are a linear combination for these vijs. And then to figure out what linear combinations are possible, you wind up looking at a matrix and there's a rank that you need to check. If the rank is such and such, you have it. If it's not, it's not clear. So I could do look at the rank, and the rank argument indicated that this group was not strict EKR. I haven't proved that the rank works. I don't know how to do that rank calculation. But there is a paper, uh, I don't know how to say their names. Um, there's a paper that says that it ha the general linear group has the EKR property and that the maximum co-cliques are cosets of either the stabilizers of a point or the cosets of another group. So um, I'm optimistic that this method could sometimes be applied to one transitive groups. 
So what I did next is Gap and I were hanging out together and I asked it to check a bunch of the one transitive groups because Gap has the one transitive groups in a really convenient form. Uh, so I was going through the one transitive groups and I was looking if there's a weighting on the consciousness classes that would give me equality in the ratio bound. And you can actually set this up as a nice linear programming problem in that you can write down the equations for the eigenvalues as linear equations, and then you can ask to maximize the ratio between the largest and least eigenvalue. And so I got the computer to do that, and I was looking for things that go weird, that don't work. And I came across AGL2Q acting on the lines. Uh, this action is one transitive. Uh, you can calculate the eigenvalues easily, and the ratio bound doesn't hold. And when you put this as a linear program, and you try to find optimize the ratio between the largest eigenvalue and the least, you get absolutely nothing better. You get a really bad bound and you can't improve it by weighting the, ad the adjacency matrix, by weighting the consciousy classes. Um, so my student, uh, uh, Biddy, who's, he's here, but I can only see five faces right now. So um, we were looking at this and we found that uh, the derangement graph for AGL has a co clique of this size compared to the size of the stabilizer of a point. So we're able to find a co clique that's strictly larger than the stabilizer of a point. So this guy's not EKR. And the co cliques that we found were kind of fun. This group AGL2Q, it's impermitive on the lines. And we took the group that stabilizes the blocks of impermittivity. And what we found is this co clique was that group that stabilizes the blocks unioned with a couple of its cosets. So it has this really nice structure. It's not EKR, but there's some interesting patterns going on that depend on it being imprimitive. Uh, another example that Biddy found was uh, there's this group in SIM 18. The size of it is 324, and its derangement graph is the complete tripartite graph. The maximum cliques here are six times so the larger than the stabilizer of a point. And this group has the largest ratio between the co-clique in the graph and the stabilizer of a point that we've been able to find. And this was fun because there is a paper on the archive by Li Song and Pentingi that conjectured that the ratio is less than the root of n. And Biddy's example shows that, that that's not true, that we can actually go pretty big. Uh, we do have groups, other groups, where the derangement graph is a complete multipartite graph. And in these cases, the co cliques are much bigger than the stabilizers of the point. Um, the group is going to be primitive, but we can also show that these groups have the EKR module property. So, what's going on? Um, well, maybe I won't get into it too much, other than to say that in this case, the largest co cliques are the union of, say, if I take uh, the set of all permutations that map one to one, one to one, unioned with the set of all permutations that map one to two, unioned with the set of all permutations that map one to three. So we have this sort of structure for the maximum co cliques where they're unions of cosets of stabilizers of a point. So they don't have the EKR property. They don't have the strict EKR property, but they do have this nice little module property that they're sitting in this nice module. Um, so this is very recent work that uh, my student, uh, Vidi and uh, Pablo Spiga and I have been working on. So there's a little bit more going on, but I don't want to get into it until we've put the paper on the archive. Okay, so uh, next questions that I have would like to work on. Uh, when we're looking at two transitive groups, is the maximum co-clique always a subgroup or a coset of a subgroup? And all of my examples are yes. Uh, if it is a subgroup or a coset of a subgroup, well, if it's not, if it's, if it's a subgroup, it always seems to be isomorphic to the stabilizer of a point. It's not conjugate to it, but it's isomorphic. And I don't know what's up with that. Um, when can we use the ratio bound for transitive groups? And mostly I'm looking for when it doesn't work and what's interesting there. 
I'm also looking for interesting transitive groups. Rank three and primitive seem like a reasonable families to look at. The imprimitives have some neat stuff going on. And also this is something that my student Biddy is working on, uh, looking at groups. Uh, when can we have a derangement graph be a k-partite graph? Can we always get it? Can we only get it sometimes? Can we only get, get it when n is small? We're not really sure. And that's it. Uh oh. I understand. Okay. Uh, oh. Yeah, thank you for the good talk. Okay. Um, and now I can see a few more people. I was muted. Yeah. Uh, does anybody have questions? Mm -hmm. Were there any questions or anything? Am I muted? Just a bit of okay. lag coming through. So you've been working uh, with the EKR module property. Is this like a generalization of the EKR property in, in general? Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah, I'd say it's a generalization, but you can have one without the other. Mm -hmm. Although I don't think I have any examples where we have EKR and not where the size works, but where it's not in the module property. That if mm -hmm. the size matches the size of the, co the canonical ones, that they seem to always be in the module, in the permutation module. But that could just be a limit of what I've looked at. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, also, Ferdinand had a question. Yeah, you have the conjecture that, I mean, which is still there, that um, it's always a subgroup or a coset. How hard did you try looking for other examples? Because it's, of course, much easier to look for subgroups and cosets than for other examples. Uh, I would say medium hard, because for the groups like the PGL, the PSL, we worked hard on figuring them out. Um, for some of the other infinite families, uh, th there's this rank argument that if we can show a rank of a certain matrix, it, if we can show a certain matrix as full rank, then it has the strict EKR property. And so I can look at the small numbers and actually cal calculate the rank, but if I can't calculate the rank in general, I don't know for sure, but the little guys will work. So I would say I've looked medium hard. But you're right, like, once we know that we're only looking for groups, like, it's way easier. Okay, thank you. I have, I have a question. Um, when, when you're setting up these weightings for, for using the ratio bound, uh, well, in particular, you piqued my interest with saying that there was a unique weighting for, for one of the things you, you've got. And I'm wondering, I guess, if, if these weightings what significance they ever have, or if they just sort of are random outputs of linear programs, or, or where that unique one comes from in particular. Yeah, the unique one is interesting in that I knew what I wanted the largest eigenvalue to, like what I did is, you need the ratio between the largest and smallest to be the right number. So okay. I say the smallest is going to be negative one, and the largest is going to be whatever that number has to be. And then you take your consciousness classes, and you weight them, and you get a bunch of linear equations. So you get a bunch of linear equations that are equal, and then you want every other eigenvalue to be strictly larger than negative one. So you get a bunch of inequalities. For the one that it was unique, it was uh, PSU3Q. We had, it, the system was like overdetermined. We had like three variables, two equations or something, or three variables, four equations. We had, we had too many equations and I figured it's never ever gonna work but magically there is one unique answer. But if you start looking at say the symmetric group uh, with its action on, um, it, when you look for two intersecting permutations from the symmetric group, you can look at that as an action rather than on elements on pairs. And then you can look at that action and try and weight the consciously classes. <clears throat> and again, this is something Biddy and I were working on where we could find 
infinitely many different weightings that would work. So we set up our linear equation and then we solve it, but there's infinitely many solutions. Interesting. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, when is there unique, when are there lots? Yeah. I don't know. Karen, uh, is this like um, looking for this weighting? It sounds to me very similar to essentially finding a, a optimal solution for like low best theta. Um, but I guess since you're in an association scheme, you can you can do it as a linear program instead of a semi-definite program. I guess that's what you were doing. Yep. But were you all waiting in the association scheme? Yep. Waiting inside an association scheme. So for each of those examples with the, oh, the you know, with the, the transient groups, not with that, where the regular subgroup is not, where the minimal subgroup is not normal. So in each case, that's going to be an association scheme. Uh, say that again, I didn't understand. Well, you've got your class of t um, two transitive groups where the um, minimal normal subgroup is not regular. Is not regular. That class of groups. Yeah. And so my question is, that in, you're saying in each of those cases that you're working in an association scheme? Yeah, because we use the consciously class scheme and I just put the weighting on the consciously class. Okay, so you're working the consciously class scheme. Okay. Yeah. And I don't have to, right? Like I did the consciously class scheme because it was the easiest and there might be other weightings. Yeah, I just have a feeling that if, if you, the harder stuff. Yeah, if you weren't using a scheme, I wouldn't expect the LP stuff to work as well. Agreed. Yeah, I didn't mention the association schemes, but they're all over the place here, being very yeah. useful. Yeah. 